Chapter 8 The Society of Associated Sirens Connie had gone home to recuperate from a severe attack of pink eye. Priscilla had gone to Puerto Rico to spend two weeks with her father and the Atlantic fleet. Patty, lonely and abandoned, was thrown upon the school for society. And Patty at large was very likely to get into trouble. On the Saturday following the double departure, she, with Rosalie Patton and May Van Arsdale, made a trip into the city in charge of Miss Wadsworth to accomplish some spring shopping. Patty and Rosalie each needed new hats, besides such minor matters as gloves and shoes and petticoats, and May was to have a fitting for her new tailor suit. These duties performed, the afternoon was to be given over to relaxation, at least to such relaxation as a Shakespearean tragedy affords. But when they presented themselves at the theatre, they were faced by the announcement that the star had met with an automobile accident on his way to the performance, and that he was too damaged to appear. Money would be refunded at the box office. The girls still clamored for their matinee, and Miss Wadsworth hurriedly cast about for a fitting substitute for Hamlet. Miss Wadsworth was middle-aged and vacillating, and easily led and ladylike and shockable. She herself knew that she had no strength of character, and she conscientiously strove to overcome this cardinal defect in a chaperone by stubbornly opposing whatever her charges elected to do. Today they voted for a French farce with John Drew as hero. Miss Wadsworth said no with all the firmness she could assume, and herself picked out a drama entitled The Wizard of the Nile, under the impression that it would assist their knowledge of ancient Egypt. But the wizard turned out to be a recent and spurious imitation of the original historical wizard. She was ultra-modern English with a French flavor. The time was tomorrow, and the scene the terrace of Shepherd's Hotel. She wore long, clinging robes of chiffon and gold cut in the style of Cleopatra along Parisian lines. Her rose-tinted ears were enhanced by drooping earrings, and her eyes were cunningly lengthened at the corners in a fetching Egyptian slant. She was very beautiful and very merciless. She broke every masculine heart in Cairo. As a climax to her shocking career of wickedness, she smoked cigarettes. Poor, bewildered Miss Wadsworth sat through the four acts, worried, breathless, horrified, fascinated. But the three girls were simply fascinated. They thrilled over the scenery and music and costumes all the way back in the train. Cairo, to their dazzled eyes, opened up realms of adventure, undreamed of in the proper bounds of St. Ursula's. The mecca of all travel had become Shepherd's Hotel. That night, long after lights out had rung, when Patty's mind was becoming an agreeable jumble of sphinxes and pyramids and English officers, she was suddenly startled awake by feeling two hands rise from the darkness and clutch her shoulders on the right and left. She sat upright with a very audible gasp, and demanded in unguardedly loud tones, "'Who's that?' The two hands instantly covered her mouth. "'Shh! Keep quiet! Haven't you any sense? Mademoiselle's door is wide open, and Lordy's visiting her.' Rosalie perched on the right of the bed, and May Mertel on the left. "'What do you want?' asked Patty crossly. "'We've got a perfectly splendid idea,' whispered Rosalie. "'A secret society,' echoed May Mertel. "'Let me alone,' growled Patty. "'I want to go to sleep.' She laid down again in the narrow space left by her visitors. They paid no attention to her inhospitality, but drawing their bathrobes closer about them, settled down to talk. Patty, being comfortably inside and warm while they shivered outside, was finally induced to lend a drowsy ear. "'I've thought of a new society,' said May Mertel. She did not propose to share the honor of creation with Rosalie. And it's going to be really secret this time. I'm not going to let in the whole school, only us three. And this society hasn't just a few silly secrets. It has an aim. 
we're going to call it the Society of Associated Sirens, Rosalie eagerly broke in. The what? demanded Patty. Rosalie rolled off the sonorous syllables a second time. The Society of Associated Sirens? Patty mumbled sleepily. It's too hard to say. Oh, but we won't call it that in public. The name's a secret. We'll call it the S.A.S. What's it for? You'll promise not to tell? May asked guardedly. No, of course I won't tell. Not even Pris and Connie when they get back? We'll make them members, said Patty. Well, perhaps. But this is the kind of society that's better small. And we three are the only ones who really ought to be members because we saw the play. But anyhow, you must promise not to tell unless Rosalie and I give you permission. Do you promise that? Oh, yes, I promise. What's it for? We're going to become sirens, May whispered impressively. We're going to be beautiful and fascinating and ruthless. Like Cleopatra, said Rosalie. And avenge ourselves on man, added May. Avenge ourselves? What for? inquired Patty, somewhat dazed. Why, for, for breaking our hearts and destroying our faith in... My heart hasn't been broken. Not yet, said May with a touch of impatience, because you don't know any men. But you will know them some day, and then your heart will be broken. You ought to have your weapons ready. In time of peace, prepare for war, quoted Rosalie. Do you think it's quite ladylike to be a siren? asked Patty dubiously. It's perfectly ladylike, said May. Nobody but a lady could possibly be one. Did you ever hear of a washerwoman who was a siren? No, Patty confessed. I don't believe I have. And look at Cleopatra, put in Rosalie. I'm sure she was a lady. All right, Patty agreed. What are we going to do? We're going to become beautiful and fascinating, with a fatal charm that ensnares every man who approaches. Do you think we can? There was some doubt in Patty's tone. May's got a book, put in Rosalie eagerly, about beauty and grace. You soak your face in oatmeal and almond oil and honey, and let your hair hang in the sun, and whiten your nose with lemon juice, and wear gloves at night, and— You really ought to have a bath of ass's milk, interrupted May. Cleopatra had, but I'm afraid it will be impossible to get. And you ought to learn to sing, added Rosalie, and have some— one song like Lorelei that you always hum when you're about to ensnare a victim. The project was foreign to Patty's ordinary train of thought, but it did have an element of novelty and allurement. Neither May nor Rosalie were the partners she would naturally have chosen in any enterprise, but circumstances had thrown them together that day, and Patty was an obliging soul. Also, her natural common sense was wandering. She was still under the spell of the Egyptian sorceress. They discussed the new society for several minutes more until they heard the murmur of Miss Lord's voice bidding Mademoiselle good night. There's Lordy, Patty whispered warily. I think you'd better to go to bed. We can plan the rest in the morning. Yes, let's, said Rosalie with a shiver. I'm freezing. But we must first take the vow, insisted May Mertel. We ought really to do it at midnight, but maybe half-past ten will do as well. I've got it all planned. You two say it after me. They joined hands and whispered in turn, I most solemnly promise to keep secret the name and object of this society, and if I break this oath, may I become freckled and bald and squint-eyed and pigeon-toed, now and for evermore. The three members of the S.A.S. devoted their leisure during the next few days to a careful study of the work on beauty, and painstakingly set about putting its precepts into practice. Some of these seemed perplexingly at variance. The hair, for example, was to be exposed to air and sunlight, but the face was not. They cleverly circumvented this difficulty, however. The week's allowance went for chamois skin. 
During every recreation hour they retired to an airy knoll in the lower pasture and sat in a patient row with hair streaming in the wind and faces protected by homemade masks. One afternoon, a little junior A, wandering far afield in a game of hide-and-seek, came upon them unawares and returned to the safe confines of the playground with frightened shrieks. Dark rumors began to float about the school as to the aim and scope of the new society. Suggestions ranged all the way from Indian squaws to druid priestesses. They almost met with disaster while acquiring the ingredients of the oatmeal poultice. The oatmeal and lemon were comparatively easy. The cook supplied them without much fuss. But she stuck at the honey. There were jars and jars of strained honey in the storeroom, but the windows were barred, and the key was in the bottom of Nora's pocket. Confronted by the immediate necessity of becoming beautiful, they could not placidly sit down for five days and wait for the weekly shopping trip to the village. Besides, with a teacher in attendance, there would be no possible chance of making the purchase. Honey was a contraband article, in the same class with candy and jam and pickles. They discussed the feasibility of filing through the iron gratings, or of chloroforming Nora and stealing the key. But in the end, Patty accomplished the matter by the use of a little simple blarney. She dropped into the kitchen one afternoon with the plaintive admission that she was hungry. Nora hastened to supply a glass of milk and a piece of bread and butter, while Patty perched on a corner of the carving table and settled herself for conversation. The girls were not supposed to visit the kitchen, but the law was never rigidly enforced. Nora was a social soul, and she welcomed callers. Patty praised the apple dumplings of last night's dessert, progressed from that to a discussion of the engaging young plumber who at the moment claimed all of Nora's thoughts. Then, by a natural transition, she passed to Honey. Before she left, she had obtained Nora's promise to substitute it for marmalade the next morning at breakfast. The members of the SAS brought pin trays to the meal and unobtrusively transferred a supply from their plates to their laps. But even so, disaster still threatened. Patty had the misfortune to collide with Avelina Smith in the upper hall, and she dropped her pin tray honey side down in the middle of the rug. At the same instant, Miss Lord bore down upon her from the end of the corridor. Patty was a young person of resource. The emergency of the moment rarely found her napping. She plumped down on her knees in the midst of the puddle, and with widespread skirts commenced frantically searching for an imaginary stick-pin. "'Is it necessary for you to block up the entire hall?' was Miss Lord's only comment as she passed. The rug was happily reversible, and by the simple process of turning it over, Patty satisfactorily cleaned up the mess." The other two girls were generous and shared their supply, so in the end she obtained her honey. For three wakeful nights they stuck to the poultice, though perhaps it would be more accurate to say that the poultice stuck to them. In spite of many washings in hot water, their faces became noticeably scaly. Miss Sally, who represented St. Ursula's Board of Health, met Patty Wyatt in the hall one morning. She took her by the chin and turned her to the light. Patty squirmed embarrassedly. "'My dear child, what is the matter with your face?' "'I... I don't know exactly. It seems sort of... of... dandruffy.' "'I should think it did. What have you been eating?' "'Only what I get at meals,' said Patty, relievedly telling the truth. "'There's something the matter with your blood,' diagnosed Miss Sally." What you need is a tonic. I shall prescribe bone-set tea for you. Oh, Miss Sally, Patty earnestly remonstrated. I don't need it, really. I'm sure I'll be all right. She had tried bone-set tea before. It was the bitterest brew that was ever concocted. When Miss Sally met Mae Van Arsdale suffering from the same complaint, and later still Rosalie Patton, she commenced to be perturbed. The apple trees under her care at the farm had been afflicted that spring with San Jose scale, but she had hardly expected the disease to spread to the schoolgirls. That afternoon she superintended an infusion of bone set of gigantic proportions, and at bedtime a reluctant school formed in line and filed past Miss Sally, 
who, ladle in hand, presided over the punch-bowl. Each received a flowing cupful and drank it with what grace she might until Patty's turn came. She disposed of hers in a blue china umbrella holder which stood in the hall behind Miss Sally's back. The remainder of the line successfully followed her lead. Miss Sally watched her little charges closely for the next few days, and sure enough the scales disappeared. The associated sirens had discarded poultices. She was much more than ever convinced of the efficacy of boneset. Shortly after the founding of the society, May Mertel returned from a weekend visit to her home. Her mother was ill, and she had been sent for. Someone in May's family was conveniently ill a great deal of the time. She brought with her three bracelets of linked scales representing a serpent swallowing his tail. S.A.S. in tiny letters was engraved between the emerald eyes. "'They are perfectly sweet,' said Patty, with grateful appreciation. "'But why a snake?' "'It isn't a snake, it's a serpent,' May explained. "'To represent Cleopatra. "'She was the serpent of the Nile. "'We'll be serpents of the Hudson.' "'With the appearance of the bracelets, "'curiosity in the S.A.S. increased. "'But unlike the other secret societies "'which had appeared from time to time, "'its raison d'être remained a mystery. "'The school really commenced to believe "'that the society had a secret.' Miss Lord, who had a reputation of being curious, stopped Patty one day as she was leaving the Virgil class, and admired the new bracelet. "'And what may be the meaning of S.A.S.?' she inquired. "'It's a secret society,' said Patty. "'Ah, a secret society,' Miss Lord smiled. "'Then I suppose the name is a deep mystery.' She lowered her voice as she said it to sepulchral depths. There was something peculiarly irritating about Miss Lord's manner. It was always suggested that she was amused by the vagaries of her little pupils. She did not possess Miss Sally's happy faculty of meeting them on a level. Miss Lord peered down from above, through lorgnettes. "'Of course the name is secret,' said Patty. "'If that got out, it would give the whole thing away.' "'And what is the object of this famous society?' "'Or is that, too, a secret?' "'Why, yes, that is. I mustn't tell you exactly.' Patty smiled up at Miss Lord with the innocent, seraphic gaze that always warned those who knew her best that it was wisest to let her alone. "'It's a sort of branch of the Sunshine Society,' she added confidentially. "'We're to, well, to smile on people, you know, and make them like us.' "'I see,' said Miss Lord with an air of friendly understanding. Then S.A.S. stands for Sunshine and Smiles? Oh, please, you mustn't say it out loud. Patty lowered her voice and threw an anxious glance over her shoulder. I wouldn't tell anybody for worlds, Miss Lord promised solemnly. Thank you, said Patty. It would be dreadful if it got out. It is a very sweet womanly society, Miss Lord added approvingly but you ought not to keep it all to yourselves. Can't you let me be an honorary member of the S.A.S.? Certainly, Miss Lord, said Patty sweetly. If you care to belong, we should love to have you. Lordy wants to be a siren, she announced to her two fellow members when she met them shortly in the gymnasium. The account of the interview was received with hilarity. Miss Lord was anything but the accepted type of siren. I thought a few smiles might relieve the gloom of Latin class, Patty explained. It amuses Lordy to think she's helping the children in their play, and it doesn't hurt the children. For a time the S.A.S. flourished with the natural health of youth, but as the novelty wore off, the business of becoming beautiful grew onerous. May and Rosalie continued to study the beauty book with dogged perseverance. The subject lay along the line of their natural ambitions. But Patty felt other matters calling. Springfield sports had commenced, and the nearness of the annual match with Highland Hall crowded out her interest in cold cream and almond meal. She and May were not naturally simpatica, and in spite of May's insistence, Patty became an apathetic siren. One Saturday, just after the spring recess, Patty received permission to lunch in town with Uncle Bobby. He was an uncle by courtesy only 
but Patty had failed to inform the dowager that the title was not his by natural right. She knew well what the result would be. It is quite proper to have luncheon with an uncle, and quite improper with even the oldest and baldest of family friends. When the hearse returned from the station at dusk with Mademoiselle and the city contingent, Rosalie Patton was waiting the arrival on the porte cochere. She separated Patty from the group and whispered in her ear, "'The most awful thing has happened.' "'What?' Patty demanded. "'The S.A.S. All is discovered.' "'Not really?' cried Patty, aghast. "'Yes. Come in here.' Rosalie drew her into the empty cloakroom and shut the door. "'You mean they found out the name and everything?' Patty demanded breathlessly. "'Not quite everything.' "'But they would have if it hadn't been for Lordy. "'She saved us for once.' "'Lordy saved us?' "'There was incredulity mixed with Patty's horror. "'What do you mean?' "'Well, yesterday May went shopping in the village with Miss Wadsworth, "'and you know what kind of chaperone Waddy makes.' "'Patty nodded impatiently. "'Anybody could fool her. "'And May, right under her very nose, "'commenced a flirtation with the soda-water clerk. "'Oh,' said Patty hotly, "'how perfectly horrid! "'She didn't care anything about it, really. "'She was just trying to put the principles of S.A.S. into practice. "'She might at least have picked out somebody decent.' "'Well, he is quite decent. "'He's engaged to the girl at the underwear counter in blood goods, "'and he didn't want to be flirted with a bit.' "'But you know how persistent May Martell is when she makes up her mind. "'The poor young man just couldn't help himself. "'He was so embarrassed that he didn't know what he was doing. "'He gave Hester Pringle half chocolate and half sarsaparilla, "'and she says it was a perfectly awful combination. "'It made her feel so sick that she couldn't eat any dinner. "'And all this time Waddy just sat and smiled into space and saw nothing. "'But all the girls saw.' "'and so did the drugstore man.' "'Oh,' said Patty breathlessly. "'And this morning Miss Sally went to the drugstore "'to get some potash for Harriet Gladden's sore throat, "'and he told her all about it.' "'What did Miss Sally do?' asked Patty faintly. "'Do? She came back with blood in her eye "'and told the dowager, and they called up May Mertel, "'and then—' "'Rosalie closed her eyes and shuddered.' Well, said Patty impatiently, what happened? The dowager was perfectly outraged. She told May that she had disgraced the school and that she would be expelled, and she wrote a telegram to May's father to come and take her away, and she asked May if she had anything to say for herself, and May said it wasn't her fault, that you and I were to blame just as much as she because we were all in a society together, but that she couldn't tell about it because she'd sworn. Beast, said Patty. So then they sent for me and commenced asking questions about the SAS. I tried not to tell, but you know the way the dowager looks when she's angry. Even a sphinx would break down and tell everything it knew, and I never did pretend to be a sphinx. All right, said Patty, bracing herself for the shock. What did they say when they heard? They didn't hear. I was just on the point of breaking my vows and telling all when who should pop in but Lordy? And she was perfectly splendid. She said she knew all about the S.A.S., that it was a very admirable institution, and that she was a member herself. She said it was a branch of the Sunshine Society, and that May had never meant to flirt with the young man. She had just meant to smile and be kind to everybody she came in contact with, and he had taken advantage. And May said yes, that was the way of it, "'and she shoved off all the blame on that poor innocent soda-water clerk. "'Just like her,' Patty nodded. "'And now May is perfectly furious with him for getting her into trouble. "'She says that he's a horrid little thing with a turned-up nose "'and that she'll never drink another glass of soda-water "'as long as she stays in St. Ursula's. "'And they're going to let her stay?' "'Yes. The dowager tore up the telegram.' "'But she gave May ten demerits and made her go without dessert for a week "'and learn Thanatopsis by heart. "'And she can't ever go shopping in the village any more. "'When she needs new hair ribbons or stockings or anything, "'she must send for them by some of the other girls. 
and what's the dowager going to do to us? Nothing at all, and if it hadn't been for Lordy, we'd all three have been expelled. And I've always detested Lordy, said Patty contritely. Isn't it dreadful? You simply can't keep enemies. Just as you think people are perfectly horrid and begin to enjoy hating them, they all of a sudden turn out nice. I hate May Mertel, said Rosalie. So do I, Patty agreed cordially. I'm going to leave her old society. I'm already out, Patty glanced toward the mirror, and I'm not freckled and I'm not squint eyed. What do you mean? Rosalie stared. She had for the moment forgotten the dread nature of the oath. I've told Uncle Bobby. Oh, Patty, how could you? I, I, that is. Patty appeared momentarily confused. You see, she confessed, I thought myself that it would be sort of interesting to practice on somebody, so I, I just tried. And did he? Patty shook her head. It was awfully uphill work. He never helped a bit. And then he noticed my bracelet and wanted to know what SIS meant. And before I knew it, I was telling him. What did he say? First he roared. Then he got awfully sober, and he gave me a long lecture. It was really very impressive. Sort of like Sunday school, you know. And he took the bracelet away from me and put it in his pocket. He told me he'd send me something nicer. What do you suppose it will be? asked Rosalie interestedly. I hope it won't be a doll. Two days later, the morning mail brought a small parcel for Miss Patty Wyatt. She opened it under her desk in geometry class. Buried in jeweler's cotton, she found a gold linked bracelet that fastened with a padlock in the shape of a heart. On the back of one of Uncle Bobby's cards was written, This is your heart. Keep it locked until the chap turns up who has the key. Patty deflected Rosalie as she was turning into French and privately exhibited the bracelet with pride. Rosalie regarded it with sentimental interest. What has he done with the key? she wondered. I suppose, said Patty, he's got it in his pocket. How awfully romantic! It sounds sort of romantic, Patty agreed with the suggestion of a sigh. But it isn't really. He's thirty years old. And beginning to be bald. End of chapter eight.